Dr. Joseph Martin here, Skanagoa Segal, as we say in our Mohawk way. Kaderi Degaguita. Kaderi Degaguita is a Mohawk woman who is a wonderful uh, mentor for me personally when I was a young man as a Mohawk man, Mohawk mystic, and like herself. She was born in 1656 in Upper New York State, and after a very brief 24-year life, which is very tragic and filled with all kinds of challenges, she passed into spirit in 1680. She was born in Upper New York State uh, to a Mohawk chief father and an Algonquian woman mother who had already been uh, adopted into the Roman Catholic uh, religion. Now, Gaderi was brought into the Mohawk way as a member of the Turtle Clan, which of course in our Mohawk way she would get through her mother. She uh, was living in a time of great social upheaval and unrest. This was a time for the Mohawks when the Dutch uh, from around New York uh, City, where it is these days, and the French who were uh, marauding around places of Northeastern America, and of course in uh, present-day Quebec, were um, killing lots of Mohawks in, in all the villages that they could find. So in fact, this is how um, Kaderi found herself to be an orphan. Both her parents were killed in these massacres, the massacres of the innocents. Um, having th experienced that, she was taken in by some of her relatives in our Mohawk tradition, this is what we do. And eventually though, uh, she did become a convert to Roman Catholicism and moved to Ganawage, which is a, a suburb now of Montreal and still a Mohawk territory for our people. There she was brought under the spiritual discipline of the Jesuits, the missionaries of the French, and she was instructed in many ways. She had also suffered the results of smallpox, again, brought by the Europeans when they invaded our territories. And uh, she had scars all over her face and her body. So it was said that she often just wore a veil over her head and somewhat over her face too, uh, so people wouldn't see all the smallpox scars. The um, spiritual um, directors of the Jesuits, they taught her all kinds of things, particularly the for them the importance of bodily uh, mortification, or what we call corporal mortification. So she learned as a teenager to uh, go uh, for fasts in a very prolonged series of days, weeks, and more. She would burn her body with hot coals. She would scar herself with flogging herself Sometimes it's said that she flogged herself uh, a thousand times a day. She slept on a bed of thorns and so on. And um, through all this process, she also uh, had chosen a path of being a virgin for her entire life. Um, this led up to her intense devotion to Jesus, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> and uh, she was given the capacities through her Christ consciousness to heal a lot of people, uh, both uh, during her life and, of course, since her passing into spirit at 24 years of age in 1680. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, in uh, 1980, she was be called beatitude or uh, beatification, and in 2012, she was made a full-fledged saint, meaning that there were a number of examples of miracles happening recently about her, um, through her, for people here in, in our century. Now, I would be seriously remiss if I didn't say something about her personality and her nature and what she was inducted into. Uh, she was, and I'll tell you a number of stories uh, that are similar to her story as well. You know, it's very clear that uh, Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple and called the Pharisees and, uh, and the Sadducees, you know, whitewashed tombs because they knew all the law, but they didn't have a clear, good, open, righteous heart. 
And, you know, there are many examples in my PhD of the Mohawk people in Gansadage, which is a nearby village to Gansadage, also in southern Quebec. I was able to research in Latin and through the text of the Jesuits, uh, Jesuit relations, we call them, and also in Latin, the, the Sulpician Fathers, the Les Messieurs de saint sulpice uh, who also took over all the native peoples uh, of, of our place, our time, our culture. We, we know that um, the Jesuit um, dis disciplinarians told Kateri, as they did with all our other Mohawk people, that to be a follower of their religion, they could, she could no longer believe in the creator, Songwaya Tizo, who's our, our Mohawk creator, she had to give up her language, her culture, uh, all her traditions as a Mohawk woman. And she also had to give up the use of dreams, which is very important for our connection with the Creator Songwaya Tizo, uh, just in order to be uh, brought into the Catholic Church. Now, I would suggest if you haven't read the book Orenda by Joseph Boyden that just came out this year, 2013, that you take a close look at the the Wendat people and the fall of that entire nation basically through many factors, but certainly one of them is the, the Jesuit people and, and their deceitful ways in colonizing the minds of people and um, giving them liquor, uh, which has become a rampant issue for among our First Nations Indigenous peoples, not only in North America, but in all the places of the world. And also the fact that they denied people their own true tradition, culture, heart, and soul. Now, obviously, and I feel for those priests and those bishops in the Catholic Church, I can only imagine what they're feeling, all the karma that they're incurring and inculcating in themselves. Nevertheless, this is a social, political, historical reality, and it is what it is. But in all my 40-plus years of counseling, uh, people uh, as a clinician, as a, uh, an anthropologist as well, but as a psychotherapist, psychologist, many of my uh, clients were Catholic. I myself am not. Um, and I found that they, they, they strive with an overwhelming grief and sadness and guilt and embarrassment, embarrassment and shame about the, the negativity that's poured on their mind and their feelings and their emotions and their psyche and their soul and their body about not being good enough and being sinful and so on. I, our people, we choose not to believe in sin, the Mohawks, the First Nations Indigenous Peoples. It's a, it's a, a concept brought to the world strictly by men, not God, by religions and not God. And it's done so much damage, as we know, through the history of not just the Catholic Church, but all the churches, synagogues, and temples of the world. And this young woman, in, in her orphaned state and in her uh, challenged state of, you know, social change and warfare, you know, um, did she have a clear choice as to how she wanted to live her life? And the excessive mortification just shows how shaming and how self-abusive, self-hateful, and self-loathing the whole system can be. The damage done to the psyche is unknown except to someone like myself who spent 40 years listening to people cry and cry and cry and cry and the anger that has to come first. This um, humanly induced guilt and shame and, uh, has such a, a negative effect on the whole psyche and the personality. In Gaderi's case, um, it perhaps, you know, she had no other out to it. And in the end, of course, notwithstanding the Catholic Church or any other world religions, a human soul like Gaderi is capable of having a personal mystical experience with Jesus. And this is highly recognizable in her and something to be highly esteemed and something to be followed as a model, whether you're a young woman, an older woman, a man, or whomever you may be. I would suggest looking at Kaderi's true story as she has lived it, not as it has been told by those who are in the church. Now, you will see when you read Joseph Boyden's books or any other text dealing with the interrelationships over 500 years between our Haudenosaunee or Wendat people and the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. And I want to give you another example 
from my um, 18 years of study and research and living uh, with my people here in Ghana, Sadage, in Oka, Quebec, which was where the first war of independence and freedom for our people was fought by grandmothers, mothers, and children, so that uh, the graves and bones of our ancestors would not be turned over and desecrated. Um, that was in 1990. There was a chief, Joseph Swan, Onisankalat, we say in the Mohawk way, who lived in the 1800s there in Ganasatage, Lake of Two Mountains, Oka. And he was a bright young teenager, like Kaderi, 200 years prior to him. And he had learned Latin, he had learned French, and of course he was a Mohawk chief as well. And he uh, was studying at the seminary in Montreal as well, uh, under the Jesuits and the Sulpicians. Now, when he got clear in his mind and heart and conscience that the teachings of the Catholic Church, as it was given to him, were very formidably uh, overtly disciplinary, controlling, dominating, and suggested you needed to have an intermediary between you and the Creator, uh, and many, many other things, including the guilt and the subterfuge, and, and direct in my historical research, lies and deception, poisonings by the Sulpician um, priests, killing a lot of our people, stealing our lands, cutting down our trees, uh, and taking away just about everything in our culture and language. We realized that, in fact, or Joseph Swan realized that uh, this was not something that was good for his people. You know, it was the forked tongue that so many First Nations have experienced over so many centuries here and elsewhere around the globe. When he determined that he was going to confront uh, this by going to Ottawa to seek some political retribution against the Sulpicians who were taking away all the lands and, and killing his people, actually. There's many stories I have about how infected smallpox blankets were brought back from the American Civil War and given uh, directly to the natives to kill them, and, and also poison in the, in the soup bowls that were given out in front of the Sulpician Church in, in downtown Oka. Many, many stories I heard from so many elders and people in historical records. There was no sense of justice or freedom. And when the, the politicians didn't really help, and uh, the truth speaking of Dr. Uh, Joseph Swan uh, didn't help when he tried to directly confront the Sulpicians and the Jesuits, in, in eventuality and actuality, they did murder him. They poisoned him uh, on the way to Montreal at one point when he was going to uh, communicate in a nice openly confrontation, confrontational way. So we have many examples in our way, in our history, of how the Catholic Church, on one hand, seems to be offering something on the other, uh, offering nothing but death and um, subterfuge and... Um, oppression, just say it the way it is. Kateri de Gagrita has been with me my entire life as a Mohawk when I was living in Ganesadage and I visited Ganawage so many times. And you know, you too can speak with her directly in spirit. She has lots of love, blessings, and knowledge to share with you. And her story is another unique one of how an individual under oppression and under dire circumstances uh, loss of family, uh, illness, smallpox, and so on, can still go inside and find the true spirit of Jesus and open to that. And her last words, her dying words, were, I love you, Jesus. Well, nothing can be better than saying that at any point of your life or on your way back home to spirit into his heart and his arms. I love you, Jesus. What a memorial to Kaderi Dega Grita, one of our great, great indigenous peoples of all times. It's gonna go where the peace is great.